Okay, everyone, we're about to get started. All right, well, welcome everyone to the High Weekly Research Seminar. I'm Russell Wald, the Deputy Director uh, here at HAI, and I'm thrilled to introduce to you uh, our speakers today, uh, Solgi Park, Allison Puccioni, and uh, Francesca Virgo. Uh, uh, Sol Solgi is a research scientist here at Stanford at the Door School of Sustainability and she brings a wealth of knowledge and expertise to our discussion. Her research includes uh, US nuclear waste management and utilizing geological oil resources to better understand North Korea's weapons production capacity. Allison is the principal and founder at the Armillary Services, as well as an affiliate and consultant with Stanford's Center for International Security and Cooperation and adds in, uh, valuable insights from her multifaceted experience. And last but not least, uh, we have Francesca Vervo, uh, is an accomplished uh, scholar pursuing her master's in international policy and a Knight Hennessy scholar here at Stanford. And we hope that she'll enrich the dialogue with her background in global affairs. AI is un an untapped component of, uh, of space-derived insights about global security. High resolution images uh, over millions of square kilometers of Earth's surface each day, yet a human analyst can only review a tiny fraction of this data, creating a vast delta between what is known and what is knowable in images collected from space. Imagery analysis has long been, uh, assist has long been assisted by processes like the, autom uh, the automated, automated detection of objects such as ships and aircraft, but there's little AI assisted analysis for delivering insights. Stanford University faculty and students supported by HAI recently embarked on its first of its kind effort to work, uh, to work toward uh, implementing AI into satellite imagery analysis. And that is the basis of, for today's seminar. So thank you for joining us uh, on this compelling exploration of uh, knowledge and innovation and uh, geopolitics a little bit as well. Uh, and we'll turn that over. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for being here. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be sitting with my co-panelists today. Um, I'd like to get into our slides by doing a little bit of level setting. I wanna make sure that everyone knows that up until about 20 years ago, uh, satellites that take high resolution or really clear pictures of the Earth's surface were relegated to a very small handful of super, proto, you know, pro superpower, post super, post Cold War um, countries like the United States, like Russia. They were highly classified and they were completely restricted from public use. Uh, however, over the past 20 years, um, Many, specifically the uh, U.S. government, the same U.S. government that classifies its imagery, um, uh, started investing heavily in a number of organizations, specifically the California-based tech community, because uh, for two reasons. One, they wanted to build something like an aeronautical industry only for a commercial space industry in the United States. But moreover, the U.S. government was unable to fulfill its own need for imagery and reconnaissance within the confines of its own defense industry companies like Lockheed Martin. So they started spending money, a lot of money to organizations and companies to build their own satellites, their own rockets. And today we're able to look at uh, a number of um, satellite images that were what I call actionable intelligence um, only 15, 20 years ago. So this is a relegate, this is a formally classified data set that's available to us today. Now I'm going to see if this works. I don't actually know if, no. Nope. I will initiate a video here if you just bear with me. Okay, so this is kind of how a satellite works. It's uh, not parked in space. It can't back up. It actually rotates around the world every 128 minutes. And on its way, customers can pay about $10,000 a pop to get the satellite to take an image uh, customize over the area, the date, the time that they say. This is the GOI-1. It's a commercial satellite. And as you can see, it's imaging Brittany. And as it passes overhead, it has to quickly turn 
and image over southern Spain. So again, it costs a lot of money to tell the satellite where to point and shoot. And the dirty secret is the only people that can afford to do that are essentially same governments that have their own national technical means of satellites. However, once the satellite image is taken, the image goes into a very deep archive and that image is about between 120 and 500 to $600 a pop. So today we have 60 commercial satellites in space that any single person in this room with a credit card can purchase from archives. Here you see not just a single image that was taken, but a lot of images that were taken in sequence. So we're in a robust area where you're not just looking at imagery, but you get to look at movement. The behavior of movement, that fourth dimension is incredibly interesting. So we can all buy satellite imagery. I've kind of had to um, hit that home because people still think this is a relegated data set. The archives are enormous. Um, however, imagery doesn't analyze itself, right? This map here is just an example. This map took me six months to make. See these little red squares of where the uh, terrorist organization Boko Haram is? It took me 60,000 square kilometers of, of satellite imagery taken by a French satellite. And it took me six months to ascertain. It's a painstaking process and it's a very human involved process. It took me forever. This was $300,000 of imagery and I almost ruined my eyesight. So I just wanna hit home. This is very difficult, but we're learning about things like uh, terrorism, things that we're doing specifically is nuclear proliferation. Um, we can discuss the ethical issues of being imaged from space. However, I, I contend that knowledge about nuclear information that was long relegated to government, state departments, and intelligence communities now can be harnessed in the media. And this is a public good. So as I said, there are, this is an archive, like anybody can look at this catalog of satellite images. There are 6,611 images that have been taken over the past 15 years or so over one single facility at North Korea's nuclear research center. So that's just one area, over 6,000 images taken. There are 15 years of vast data sets, hundreds of millions of square kilometers, but I will also say there are only 40 uh, people in the open source community, outside of the intelligence community, that actually do this. I was at a conference last week in Seoul, and 50% of the people that do imagery, related, imagery analysis related to nuclear weapons were there. So we have a lot of information. There are things in the archives of satellite imagery, high resolution satellite imagery, that are unknown. There is an event that happened that we just don't know because nobody's looking at it. So automated analysis is the key to um, enabling our insight. Any questions so far? Well, I'll just let you know, CSAC has been actually working on this uh, for 20 years. The reason being is CSAC uh, used to have a co-director named Dr. Siegfried Hecker whom President Biden considers America's preeminent nuclear scientist. And he had been to a North Korean research facility at the behest of the North Korean government. So when I first started working with CSAC with satellite imagery, it was basically me and SIG talking about what building is this, what building is that. Um, nuclear weapons facilities are very difficult uh, to analyze, right? Military Im uh, imagery analysis is you look at a fighter jet, you can say that's a fighter jet, it's pretty clear naval order of battle, air order of battle, it's all pretty similar. However, nuclear facilities are really, really hard to divine details from. Um, nuclear analysts like myself, we spend about 80% of our time researching gray literature, interviewing nuclear power plant experts, talking to people who are really knowledgeable, and then 20% of our time pouring over satellite imagery to kind of divine details from that. And so what we have today is 60 satellites that all take what's called optical imagery. Optical imagery is basically like human vision or camera sight. And that's just passive light that's documented. Very interesting stuff. It's really helped us figure it out. And we've looked for visual signatures of whether, for instance, a nuclear reactor is operating or not. And those are helping us figure out essentially nuclear arsenals around the world. If a reactor is operating, it's essentially cooking uh, uranium into an isotope, an element called plutonium that can be used for weapons grade material. So we live and die by whether or not a reactor is operational. The signatures that we have for nuclear reactors that are operational are simple. Uh, in electro-optical imagery, that looks like steam coming out of stack. Just a second. 
uh, vehicles around sub facilities, which don't even tell us if the reactor is critical. It just tells us if it's active. And then water, as you can see in this top left image, this is a GIF of water emanating into a cooling bay that's cooling the reactor line. So this is another clue. Any questions so far? So key clues to whether a reactor is operational. I'll show you this image right here. This is North Korea's two main reactors. This is the experimental light water reactor. And this is the five megawatt reactor where North Korea makes all of its plutonium for weapons. You can't, I can't tell whether that reactor is operational or not. It's just a building. So key clues pertaining to heat have remained a long mystery to us. If we can see which buildings are hot, um, we will be able to better collate the signatures from optical imagery with the signatures from thermal imagery. And cut to 2023, when the British startup company Satellite View built the world's first higher resolution thermal satellite. They launched it in the summer of 2023. Um, and fortunately, before they did, they took the same sensor on the satellite, they put it in the belly of a number of aircraft, and they took thermal images over a number of nuclear facilities. So we partnered with SatView, and we uh, ended up learning a lot about the thermal imagery signatures. And I will throw it to Fran. Thank, oh, thank you so much, Allison, and thank you all for being here today. Oh, thank you. Uh, this is very cool. And uh, as Allison said, I was on the partnership between SatVu, SatelliteVu, probably will refer to it as both of those terms throughout, uh, and an international policy class, Professor Rose Gottemuller's uh, verification for 21st century arms control treaties, which was a mouthful of a class to say, but definitely one of my favorite experiences here at Stanford so far. And this project was uh, dealing with satellite views, initial imagery that they had captured in these beginning runs. And I see my role here in this presentation as essentially establishing a foundation for us all uh, related to the actual components of nuclear reactors, as well as these obvious contrasts between optical and thermal imagery before we get into the fun stuff, which is AI as well as the more advanced analysis. So I'm first going to talk a little bit about SatVoot specific operational features before proceeding into the meat of our project's analysis, which was uh, a comparison between two nuclear plants, and then finally pitching it back to my very esteemed mentors here. So to begin, um, Satellite View was promising some big things. And uh, on these images, you can see just some pretty obvious contrasts between what was already available, which was optical imagery, which you can see quite a few features, and then low resolution uh, available thermal imagery, which is uh, from like a Landsat satellite. And, there's a lot of pixels there, is all I'm going to say. Finally, uh, the high res, this is what SatVu is promising and somewhat delivered. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of granularity. Uh, you can pick out quite a few more features than compared to the other two images. So if I was going to sell SatVu to you, that's what I would emphasize. Uh, this 3.5 meter high resolution granularity that you would able, be able to see through their imagery. Uh, and this is paired with optical imagery, so uh, you can't if you just see a thermal image with all these really multicolored spots, you might not be able to distinguish between a linear blob, could be a road, could be a pipeline. So with these optical imagery pairings, you're able to have a little bit of ground truthing for analysis, uh, which satellite view offers. Additionally, this might be obvious, but thermal imagery, thermal imagery is somewhat of an unblinking eye. It might change a little bit between day and night. However, it's, it's not inhibited by the sun going away for how it's going to analyze it. So this is just another advantage. Finally, it's ideal form. Uh, satellite view is promising an eight satellite constellation. It's what it hopes to have uh, over a period of three years with a pretty high revisit rate and then a very robust API and web-based platform. Sure, yes, please. And for those of us who are imaging science geeks, maybe it's just me, um, I'll just revisit resolution. When Fran says 3.5 meter resolution, that means each and every single pixel within the image represents 3.5 meters of ground space. The Landsat that she was looking before, everything, every pixel was 100 square meters of ground space. So it's like a football field. Um, and so the small, the lower the resolution, 3.5 meters, the better the image. Most of the optical images we look at are one meter. So sorry to geek out on you, Fran, but thank you. <laughs> Never apologize. So this project that we were on uh, was dealing with, again, not satellite imagery itself, but aerial data that was flown from a prototype over Texas and Western Europe was the areas that they had captured. And the archival data from these campaigns was not these really multicolored images that people mostly associate with thermal imagery. It was these black and white images behind me that white signifies hot, 
dark signifies cold, if we're going to simplify. Um, they had quite a few difficulties with capturing certain fluctuations, as this was, just the prototype. Uh, but they were targeting activities, monitoring. They had certain facilities that they were trying to capture. And with these limitations in mind, we were able to find that they had actually gotten two that were pretty comparable. The first being Graveline Nuclear Power Station, which is in northern France. Uh, it's a pressurized water reactor, which we can get to, into later. Uh, but the most important facts are that it had six reactors and it had an overall thermal capacity of around 2,800 megawatts thermal. We need another point of comparison though. So we looked to South Texas, which was the South Texas Project Electric Generating Station. Uh, South Texas, again, it has about a higher capacity of over a thousand, so about 3,800 megawatts thermal, and it had only two pressurized water reactors. So with that in mind, I'm going to use gravelines as uh, kind of a, a very introductory look into how pressurized water PWR reactors actually work. And I'm not a nuclear scientist. I will defer to Silgi on that. But this is a very basic look into how this water exchange creates steam to make electricity as the final product. So looking at that yellow line, that is the cold water intake uh, area for graveling. So first, water comes in from the North Sea here. It's cold. It goes through a couple of pipelines into the reactor where it's heated to a very high heat, pressurized water then pushes this water, creating steam. Steam goes into generator rooms, turbines turn, electricity is produced. With this byproduct, very hot water, that's then pushed back out. And that's where you see those red lines uh, numbered one through six behind me. And then it's put into a cooling bay, which again goes back out into the North Sea on the other side. Looking into the specific facilities within this uh, plant, we can see some things we've already identified, like those uh, hot water discharge lines are in orange. We see the cooling bay as well as the discharge lane. But most importantly, we're now looking at the reactor facilities. So numbered one through six, those are in red. Behind that in green is these turbine generator buildings where the turbine stern electricity is produced. And that is then transmitted out as a high voltage form into these electronic switching yards, which then transmit this electricity outwards to its final destinations. Okay, this is the cool part, and at least to maybe the nerds here. But for the satellite view raw images, uh, this is the thermal imagery, and you can see some things that we would generally expect. As I said before, uh, this hot water is pushed out of the plant when electricity is produced, and that is lighting up very hot in red. You can see that uh, where it's going out into the hot water discharge area. Behind that, we have a little bit of a heat signature associated with the reactor area, where there's quite a few facilities uh, dedicated to this overall product. But most excitingly to our group were these six individual dots in pink behind the general reactor area. And as you remember, there were six reactors within this plant. And we were very excited because we were like, wow, there is about a city's worth of concrete on these reactors. It would be very crazy for this satellite to be able to pick up a heat signature there. So we did the overlay and maybe I'm giving away the conclusion here, but as you can see, those six signatures were not, in fact, the reactors. They were the electronic switching yards behind the reactors where the electricity is transmitted outwards. Um, and I'm a grad student, and I did this analysis, so it might not be up to the, the top tier, but we were pretty confident in our results, given that uh, these heat signatures were relatively aligned with where we would expect uh, the hot cooling water to hot water that needed to be cooled to be pushed out in the intake water as well, which is on the left where that pink arrow is. Uh, but with the switching yards, I don't mean to discount that as a finding. Uh, this, is, this is new. No one had been able to do this kind of analysis before. Uh, you would not be able to see that these electronic switching yards were active in an optical image. So the fact that we were able to pick this up and to have this as a new signature of operational uh, capacity of criticality in this reactor was very cool. But we needed a point of comparison, so we went down to South Texas. And we're all experts now, so you can see a couple of the features that were also in the other PWR reactor, like hot water discharge, intake, two reactors within this facility, turbine generator rooms behind that, and then, of course, the electronic switching yard in red. These are the raw images for the archival data for the South Texas plant. Uh, a little bit more messy. Uh, this is, again, showing some of the limitations of this archival data. but. Most importantly, we can see some of the things that we saw before. Of course, the heating discharge lanes are lighting up pretty hot. Uh, the switching yard had somewhat of a heat signature associated with it, but was what was the most uh, hot, I guess, here that had the largest heat signature were these reactor turbine rooms, which you would generally expect to have 
a little bit of shielding infrastructure on top of it. Um, so it's it was unexpected for us to see that this had such a high heat signature and is definitely something that we flagged. So this was our overall team when we watched the satellite view uh, launch in June of 2023. And um, it was definitely an honor to be on this project. I think as a grad student, contributing something that is new and novel to this field that is obviously has such a long history uh, was rare and definitely very meaningful. And I'm incredibly grateful to the HAI Center as well as Allison, uh, Professor Gottemuller as well for allowing this project to, to go forward. And again, having these two heat signatures for future analysis uh, is very, very cool. And as we apply it to other places like China, Russia or North Korea, it's definitely an exciting space to be in. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, and I'll, um, I cannot stress enough how exciting it was to kind of look at this. Um, I think one thing, one of the best things about working under the auspices of HAI was it was a teaching environment, right? And usually I'm kind of like 30 years in the business, like I'm the old guy in the room that, that knows everything, has seen it all. But I had never seen commercial thermal satellite imagery analysis, so we were all learning together. And I apologize because Fran's heard this before, but um, those of you who work in code have maybe heard the term zero day defects, if I'm understanding that correctly. And it's a really rare bug in software that can be exploited. And when it comes to looking at nuclear facilities, it's almost like a zero day, you know, like one of those defects where you can see whether a nuclear reactor is operational or not. Countries obfuscate activity in their reactors on purpose. So it's almost this cat and mouse game. We've literally, in 2013, we published this one water pipe that was only on when a reactor was. Uh, capable, you know, was operating and then the nation actually paved over that water pipe so that we couldn't see it. So having thermal imagery to calibrate that against optical imagery was a critical component and like as we start stepping towards automation. So we had the luxury of being able to experiment with the training data before the satellite even launched. So we knew kind of, we knew the feel around high-res thermal imagery by the time um, my amazing colleague, Dr. Sulgi Park, was looking at optical imagery of North Korea's experimental light water reactor, um, construction of which started in 2008, building was complete in 2013, and everybody's been staring at this reactor ever since. When is it gonna be operational? What's gonna happen? So around October and November, Solgi started seeing some imagery uh, that had um, optical clues of whether this was uh, activated. And we started thinking the only way that we could publish this responsibly is if we get another type of sensor to verify what we're seeing in the optical imagery. We wanted to triangulate that. That's not common in commercial satellite imagery because you have a ton of optical pictures, not a lot of different sensors. And I'll throw it over to Solgi at this point. Thanks. So I'm actually going to take a step back to discuss a little bit more about the proliferation activities in North Korea pertaining to the specific light water reactors, just to give you guys a better price of the situations there and why we are looking at this facility and the utility of remote sensing analysis on this. Um, North Korea clearly is a concern for the global securities, right? There's a string of recent events, including the ongoing launch of ballistic missiles, the converging alliance between Russia and North Korea, it adopted a new law in 2022 that stipulates automatic and immediate launch of nuclear weapons, as well as the ongoing hostile rhetoric against the United States, calling to prepare for war against the United States. And all of these proliferation activities are fueling concerns, causing some experts to debate whether Kim Jong-un has made strategic decisions to go on war with Korea, in the Korean Peninsula or not. Uh, so this is a graph that shows the number of missile launches under the three generations of leadership under Kim from 1984 to 2023. And here, obviously, as, as you can see, during Kim Jong-un's tenure, the frequency and the diversity of missile launches has significantly increased. So in 2022 alone, they tested about 70 missiles or 60 missiles, depending on how you test it, and that marks the historic high in its missile program. And the diversity also includes, also expanded to include cruise missiles, hypersonic missiles, as well as the ICBM, intercontinental ballistic missiles, theoretically can hit anywhere on the continent of the United States. And those diversity has given them a lot of launch options while enhancing its counterattack capabilities. Now, as the launch, the launch numbers increase, the failure rates then correspondingly decreases, with the current rate averaging at less than 10% compared to almost 60% in the 1990s. So during Kim Jong-un's tenure, there's that one year, one block in 2018, when they did not conduct any missile tests. And that coincides with the Trump-Kim diplomacy, 
And that showed a pretty successful initial start with the Singapore summit in 2018. But it faltered at the subsequent summit in Hanoi in 2019. And when that diplomacy fell apart, North Korea started adopting a really hostile stance and they started by destroying the liaison office, which is a joint communication center between two Koreas. And that was accompanied with the accelerated nuclear weapons programming in, from both quantity as well as quality perspective. Uh, so today, the estimated nuclear warheads and the open source for North Korea ranges anywhere from about 10 to slightly over 100. Uh, so that's a bit of a range there. And that discrepancy is attributed to the types of nuclear weapons that they are accounting for, but that ultimately depends on the estimated stock of fissile materials. The fissile materials, I'm talking about the main ingredients, plutonium and uranium that makes nuclear weapons. Uh, so when you look at where these fissile materials are coming from in North Korea, uh, first and foremost, there's, there's this five megawatt indigenous nuclear reactor that generates spent fuel from which they can reprocess fissile materials in the form of plutonium. Then, of course, they have an enrichment facility where they can enrich uranium-235 to be on 90%, and that makes the weapons great. And last but not least, the facility that we want to showcase in this part of the presentation is the 25 megawatts light water reactor. And so that's five times the capacity of the original 5 megawatt plutonium producer, but its operational status has remained under the questions for about a decade or so. Now, all of these highlighted facilities are located in Yangbyon, and that's approximately 80 kilometers north of its capital city, Pyongyang. So the light water reactor. Now, North Korea started constructing this reactor as early as 2008, and the stated purpose was electricity generation, so civilian purpose. It looks like they completed this reactor in 2013 when you see the reactor dome in place, and this is, it looks completed from the outer perspective. And ever since then, we have observed quite a consistent level of activities. We saw them placing pipelines, we saw them installing power stations, and we saw them building a new constructions, including that White Bay building south of the reactor. But really, this whole time, its reactor operational status remained in question in that we never saw any signs from the remote sensing perspective that could have signaled to us that the reactor core is indeed engaged. Now, that changed about a few months ago when the attention was alerted by the International Atomic Energy Agency, prompted by the observations that they saw a strong water outflow consistent with the commissioning of the light water reactor. Now, the strong water outflow that they're talking about is right at that point. I don't think I can use the laser pointer, sorry. Um, and it's right at the east of this bay building, about 150 meters south of the light water reactor. Right? And we did the analysis to make sure that the pipeline is indeed connected to the light water reactor. So the fact that we're seeing water being discharged there does indicate that its cooling channel is indeed engaged. In all fairness, we have observed water discharge at this point dating back to 2013, right here. And we have observed it quite sparingly and quite sporadically since then. But what makes today's situation different, of course, is the consistent and strong water outflow that persisted from October of last year to March of this year. So five months, about 160 days of operations. And for the first time, that signifies the stable operations uh, since it was first built in 2013. Uh, so even with the optical images, this is a pretty significant activity that we detected. But like Allison said, in times of denied access, we really wanted to find the direct evidence that could tell us the reactor is active. Instead of inferring just from the water discharge, can we see something that gives us a better clue on whether or not this light water reactor is operating or not. So that, that's when we complemented our analysis with thermal images. Alison introduced it, Fran has beautifully described it. This is a thermal image from SAT2. It detects the infrared radiations emitted by objects, so enabling us to detect the heat anomalies that are not really visible from the optical images. So here's an example of set provided thermal image over a young yacht. And in this case, the color scale of temperature is set so that you have orange color representing higher temperatures and blue hue indicating the lower temperatures. We can overlay this with an electro-optical image and we can zoom into this reactor site to look more specifically into its heat signature. So on the left here is the five megawatt reactor and the right here is the light water reactor. If you look at its thermal signature from November 23rd of last year, the five megawatt reactor exhibits a pretty prominent heat signature. If you zoom into that, that corroborates with the operational status of five megawatts. And five megawatts, they built this in 1980. So it's a quite an old reactor and has been active ongoing operational since then. 
So it corroborates with the operational status of five megawatts evidence from the electro-optical image. As you can see, the steam is emanating from the turbine generator, so we know that it is engaged. Um, the light water reactor also shows a very minute heat signature over there, but it's quite subdued, especially comparing it to the five megawatts. But in the subsequent image, two weeks later on December 6th, you see that the heat anomalies over the light water reactor is much more enhanced. If you zoom into that, that hot spot corresponds to the power switch yard at the light water reactor, just like Graveline's nuclear power plants a friend has described. Uh, so we know that there is some electricity either going in or out of this reactor, and that confirms the fact that the reactor has certain level of activity in it. Uh, also notable is the warm water discharge from the two reactor sites as evidenced by that orange streaks along the riverbank. Uh, even with the electro-optical image, you can actually detect the warm water discharge, mostly during the winter times by the signals of snow melt. But thermal can tell us a lot more than that. First and foremost, it let us compare the temperature difference of the water discharge from these two reactor sites. And that just happens to be about four degrees Kelvin with the light water reactor discharging a slightly hotter temperature. We can also qualitatively analyze the volume of water discharge, um, in this case, by estimating the surface area of this warm hue. And the analysis shows, that that light, shows us that the light water reactor is discharging about three times more water than does the five megawatts. I'm gonna state this is a quite rudimentary analysis. It's quite elementary at this stage. It's in a developing stage, but as you can imagine, as we get more information, more data and more calibration, uh, this is the kind of information that we could use to confirm the operational status of reactor as well as the capacity under which they're operating. Um, here, I'm gonna stress the water discharge is not the sole determinant for the reactor's criticality. It, just because we see water discharge does not mean that the nuclear chain reaction in the reactor is engaged. It does not mean that they're making plutonium. But, but it does tell us that North Korea is intending to use this reactor that has been sitting idle for over 10 years. Why is that a problem? America has about like 90 reactors, most of them are light water reactors, and they're mostly used for civilian oh. uh, So light water reactors are typical reactors that they use to generate electricity. But it is not proliferation resistant. So the concern is that North Korea could strategically aim to enhance its fissile materials productions by modifying this light water reactor. Now there are approximately three different ways that it can do so, but the easiest and the safest way is, to, is by reducing this so-called burn-off factor. Burn-off is simply put fuel utilization factor. It controls the operation time of the reactor, so it tells us when to turn it on and when to turn it off. And that in turn determines the isotopic compositions of the spent fuel. Uh, so the whole point is to run it just long enough to collect what they want, and then they shut it down before they collect unwanted materials in the spent fuel. But the average burn of a civilian light water reactor is approximately 30 to 70,000 megawatt thermal per tons of uranium. In order to get weapons grade plutonium out of it, they need to reduce the burn up to about two to 3,000 megawatt thermal. But if they do successfully do so, then we're looking at anywhere between six to 17 kilograms of plutonium per cycle, where each cycle is 80 to 120 days. So that's quite short. That's two and a half months to four months. So theoretically, they can try to maximize the output by running it twice a year. And if they do do that, we're looking at 90 to 136 kilograms of additional plutonium from this reactor by end of 2030, assuming that they start operating it today for spent fuel. Um, if you combine that with the output from the five megawatt original plutonium producer, then we do get exponential curve of cumulative weapons grade plutonium moving forward. And about four to six kilograms of plutonium makes one weapon. So 90 to 136 kilograms, that's approximately 18 to 20 seven nuclear weapons that they can make. But capacity, capability does not conform to intent. We actually do not know what North Korea is intending to do with this light water reactor. And I think there is a complete possibility that they're utilizing the light water reactor exclusively for the energy purpose. Um, the fact that we saw signs of them installing electrical equipment dating back to 2012 does support the intention that North Korea does intend to use this specifically for the electricity purpose. 25 megawatt does not sound like a lot, especially compared to France, one to two gigawatts nuclear power plants, or the typical conventional light water reactor in America is also about one gigawatt. Uh, but neither is per energy consumption capita in North Korea. So 25 megawatt does not sound like a lot, 
but it does produce electricity for over 56,000 households in North Korea, assuming the per capita energy consumption is about 700 kilowatt hour per year. And that's approximately 18 times lower than the average residential per capita energy consumption in the United States. Uh, so what we're showing here today is really a little snippet from this one thermal image. You can imagine there's a lot more analysis that we can do with one image. And the story goes beyond this Yangbin main nuclear research center in North Korea. We also started looking at the alleged uranium enrichment facility outside of Yangbin in a place called Kangsan in North Korea. We also started looking at China's nuclear fuel cycle uh, pertaining to their ambitions of nuclear energy expansions. We also started looking at weapon storage in Russia, which shows certain level of activities as of November of last year. So there's a lot of studies that we can do, as Fran has alluded to, and I'm going to pass it on to Allison to talk about AI and satellite image analysis. Thank you. Yeah, amazing, Solgi. Thank you so much. Um, and so what Solgi had alluded to is sort of using um, one sensor to consistently check um, the status of not just North Korea's nuclear reactor, but a number of facilities within North Korea. Um, and what we're trying to do is the precursor to building a model that'll help us better understand signatures and help us identify buildings throughout North Korea. The time is right now because only five years ago, we simply didn't have enough imagery uh, accessible to us to be able to do like large scale training data sets. And I'll talk about um, potentially how to do that. But before I do, I want to talk about what a lot of people consider to be AI in imagery analysis has been what I consider to be like object detection or analytics, which I don't think is AI. Um, recently, I mean, a couple of years ago, there was a commercial where somebody was saying that AI is the paintbrush and you're the painter, or AI is the beer and you're the beer maker. Like what is AI? Certainly we understand that when it comes to natural language processing, but what is it when it comes to um, satellite imagery analysis? And I'll start by saying what it isn't. Object detection is when uh, there is an algorithm that automatically looks on electro-optical imagery. And as you can see at the top right, it sort of shrink wraps uh, something around an uh, object that you want to know about, right? A fighter jet is uh, always, because every pixel has a latitude and longitude, everything is measurable. And so there's a certain class of fighter jet that's exactly 22 meters long by X meters wide, has fixed wing, and you can automatically detect that. That's not training data, that's actually measurement. So object detection is something that's been used forever for sort of military or you know military grade imagery analysis. You don't want to have to look through an image and look at 600 different ships in a harbor. What object detection could do is return to you a graph of there were 600 ships in this harbor on January 1st, and then the next day would be another line in the graph with how many ships. Again, object detection is great. It's, it's a lifeline if you're um, analyzing a lot large-scale military analysis, but it is not um, what we would consider AI. Um, the second thing is called functional site deposition. That's a really fancy way of saying, tell me every pixel that's changed in an area that I'm really interested in. If you look at the bottom right image, um, this is actually a um, uh, nuclear reactor in the United Arab Emirates. And what Sulky was talking about, remember when we keep our uh, fuel assembly and fuel rods in a reactor for exactly six months, and we pull, you know, we say to the IAEA, my fuel rods will be in the reactor for 18 months. That is the fuel cycle. The reason that countries state that to the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is the UN, UN's nuclear watchdog, is because if you take the fuel assemblies out prematurely, you are looking at a different isotope in your spent fuel. You have an isotope that is correlated to weapons grade plutonium. Um, I know Solgi had mentioned that, I wanna underscore that. So right now this small red line in front of the reactor room at the Baraka nuclear power plant unit one is the area where they conduct fuel loading and reloading. So I can't look at 60 images a day over this facility, but that reactor's parking lot stays empty all of the time, unless there is a fuel loading event, during which fuel loading events actually take hundreds and hundreds of people, cars, specialized equipment. They actually put job posting boards for journeymen, nuclear you know, fuel reloaders all over the world. So if we're looking at a pixel change of 30 to 60%, then we are alerted, so we don't have to look at that. That's again, I wouldn't consider that automated uh, or AI enabled analytics. It's just sort of automated machine learning, computer-based analytics. So. 
Um, Solgi will speak to this, but this is kind of an example of the object detection. Solgi? So we're discussing this, well, I'm discussing this purely from the domain perspective, not from the AI developed perspective. But as a user, I'm just really grateful for these tools that enable us to do something that we could not have imagined before, right? Not just in terms of speeds, but the fact that algorithms can detect, see, draw patterns and draw inferences in the ways that we just don't have capacity to do so. Uh, so here's an example of the deep core machine learning engines that was trained to count cars. There's a bit of a caveat and drawbacks here, because as you can see, the number of cars change as a function of resolution. But, oops, let me see that. But with the massive influx of data, as well as increasing resolution on a daily basis, we were still able to apply such engines to study proliferation analysis in our work. Uh, so this is us counting number of vehicles in the nuclear reactor sites. And we also did this over the very front end of a nuclear fuel cycle, that is uranium mining and milling facilities, where there we counted the number of rail cars that were transporting materials in and out to the subsequent nuclear facilities. So by correlating the traffic, at the very front end from the uranium mining. And by linking that to the traffic at the very back end at the reactor operations, because you need to take uranium from the mines to operate the reactors, we're able to get a more holistic view of the nuclear weapons program in North Korea. Uh, so the images here, the graphs underneath here is the number of trucks that we're counting, number of vehicles that we're counting, and the number of vehicles in each of the image was actually like few, maybe tens at most. So you might be thinking the number of vehicles here are too low to use this data analytic tools quite effectively. Uh, here's a better example where we tried to track the trade activities between North Korea and China right, right after COVID. Uh, so this was, I think, 330 images, about 2,500 cars that he counted at the end of a few clicks. And it was a really fast, speedy process for us. We were then able to parse this data into a year by the day of week, by the day of month, so we can see when the trade activities were most active. And by looking at the trend, we could also see where the trucks were coming in and out of. So the blue line at the top left graph here is counting the trucks in North Korea's depot. And the red line is counting trucks from the Chinese depot. And the fact that the blue line is trailing behind the red line indicates to us that trucks from the Chinese depot were going from China into North Korea. Um, so this is another study that we did where we used computer-assisted analysis to detect uranium mines in North Korea. Uranium, again, is the major precursor to make nuclear weapons. In order to make plutonium, we still need uranium. And there's only one confirmed uranium mine in North Korea, and the whole motivation was to see if we could detect any suspected or purported uranium mines that could have been under our radar that North Korea could use to proliferate. Uh, so this is the work done by our colleague, Federico Derby. So I'm not going to be able to take credits for this computer work that he had done. But if I could just quickly explain what he had done, uh, he took multi-spectral images from Sentinel-2, and then he drafted a mosaic of geographical landmines over North Korea, just to find the pixels that hold similar spectral signatures of the uranium tailings pile from the known uranium mine in North Korea. And so the tailings pile is that black blob within that yellow box that's just waste materials of uranium stuff that North Korea put on top after they excavate the metals from the ground. And I think the algorithm was designed based on the calculations of mathematical distances, distances between the spectral curves. And when the detection fell within the threshold, we would earmark it and call it the hotspots. At the end of a day, we found 18 hotspots in North Korea that hold the similar spectral signatures as the uranium tailings pile and Pyongyang uranium mine, which is the only uranium mine in North Korea. We then overlay with these electro-optical images just to make sure that these are indeed mines, and they were indeed mines. And we then took a step further to understand the geological makeup of those mines to make sure we know what kinds of uraniums they will be providing should they be using this for proliferation analysis. Uh, so this is a very preliminary analysis, preliminary work where we're integrating machine learning and algorithms into our work. And Allison's going to talk a little bit more about the prospects of AI integrations into such non-proliferation analysis. Yeah, before you go on to the next slide, I just want to be, I'm often, when I work with Solgi, I'm often considered the normal person in the room that translates the genius of the scientists to sort of, let's just call them policymakers. Um, but I don't want, I want to um, go and underscore how important this study was. North Korea mines its uranium indigenously. All of its nuclear weapons come from within North Korea. We have known for 20 years because there was like an, I mean, not even 20 years, it's been longer than that. There was like a Soviet article on the only known uranium mine in North Korea, Pyongsan. So for Sylvia and her colleague to go and look at a different type of sensor of imagery, the spectral signature of what's happening at the known uranium mine, and then look over the entirety of the country to find 18 new 
things with the same spectral signature. But not only that, Sulgi went into mineralogical charts that date back to like, I don't even know, like the Japanese dynasty. Yeah, yeah, um, to, to sort of triangulate uh, three different types, two types of sensors and three types of information. Um, this is what I think is the closest that we have come to what I would consider AI enabled, though I, I don't think this is technically AI, but if you're looking over an entire country and looking for just the mines and you're able to find that, that's something that we couldn't have done without the sensors. I'll also very quickly say, if you'll indulge me, there's a, there is a, North Korea makes the weapons either with plutonium or it enriches uranium in a uranium enrichment facility. We know of one uranium enrichment facility in North Korea. We know that next to this uranium enrichment facility are these really special canisters that hold uranium hexafluoride, a special gas that needs to be stored in a universally shaped canister. Five years ago, we thought about maybe we can just get more imagery, look at the rail nodes of every single you know, rail node in North Korea and see if we can find where those canisters are going. And it, five years ago, it was absolutely preposterous. But today we're looking at daily revisit rates of a large scale of North Korea with higher resolution imagery. So this is a study that we haven't undertaken, but the, for the first time it's possible. And this might lead us to this, what I call the unicorn facility and what other people call in the journalistic communi community, the unicorn facility, North Korea's second in uranium enrichment. It's suspected to be at a place called Kangsong, but even there's deliberation about that. So these are the kinds of AI principles that we could do a nationwide search using satellite imagery enabled with object detection to figure that out. So I'll talk about what I think the golden, the brass ring here of AI is. If we can move forward, oh, thank you so much. So for comparison, you know, I looked at ChatGPT the other day and I wanted to do an example of ChatGPT. I was like, like, write me a screenplay with cute baby animals as the center of, uh, of the screenplay. And I clocked it at less than one second. It wrote me a full screenplay with, you know, characters and nuance and everything like that. So natural language processing is kind of the gold standard uh, for AI. But can you use that for satellite imagery? Absolutely not. Not only did I, you know, I've actually asked ChatGPT, what are the visual signatures of um, a, an operational nuclear reactor? And it came with exactly the thing I published last month. And I thought I was the first to publish that. So I am not as good at ChatGPT and something I've been doing for 20 years. Um, and not only did it, but it, not only did it not tell me how to do this, but I think it's deaccessed me and I no longer can access OpenAI uh, just because I kept asking questions. But the final thing on the right is something went wrong and I can't, get into AI and like open AI anymore. But we are not there yet in satellite imagery. We're at the infancy stages of what an amazing uh, colleague of mine at Johns Hopkins AP Applied Physics Lab calls the unsupervised learning aspect of imagery analysis. That's when I don't tell you what to look for. You look at a bunch of images and then you tell me what I'm missing. That's kind of where I want to get to. Um, and if you'll indulge me, uh, I think it's probably evident that I'm not an AI expert, but I did work at Google when Google was trying to automate their search of YouTube videos so that people can search through the imagery rather than the text description. So if you wanted to look for a YouTube image or YouTube video with a kid with a balloon in it, um, uh, YouTube basically did, I think what a lot of us understand is sort of a training data set to help figure that out. So when you do a training data set and you're training an al algorithm to find it, you need simply 100,000 or so, just a ton of images of, in this case, Apple. Like how do you determine an Apple automatically in imagery? 100,000 images of Apple, 200,000 images of not Apple. And then finally, um, you start to get maybe a 40% success rate of already finding Apple in imagery. And then you have to iterate. I think iteration is not talked about enough. You're going to get the worst results at first, but then you kind of correct your algorithm until uh, you're starting to get like a 90, 95% rate. So what we have the ability to do, I think is there are 440 nuclear reactors in the world. However, as you've seen from my earlier Yang Bian um, example, each reactor has been imaged a thousand times at least. Yang Bian's been imaged 6,600 times. So 100,000 images of operation, nu operational nuclear reactor, operational meaning we know it's engaged. That could be that's a lot of imagery. It could be crowdsourced, but more so because we know the finite geolocation of each of the nuclear reactors, it's not like we have to go and hand select each of them. We would need humans to actually say, okay, I verified that this is operational. I can see the visual signatures. Critically, 
I, we would need a multi-sensor model. You'd need your electro-optical image of operational reactor, thermal image of operational reactor, and then you need more and again, 200,000 images of non-operational nuclear reactor. Wouldn't be difficult. And finally, if you can actually see that bottom image of not nuclear reactor, that's the Kosovo B coal plant. And many coal plants, many other facilities have that Simpson style cooling tower that tricks us into thinking it's a nuclear reactor. And the final upshot of that um, would be something like this. Instead of a chat GPT, it would be something like, find me a new signal of reactor operations after you've looked through all of that. And this is hypothetical, but this is actually not a visual signature of uh, reactor criticality, but a truck in a certain building is a signature of um, missile capability. There has to be like a transporter erector launcher that's near this. So we want to find that uh, analog for this little zero day defect signature of reactor capability. I would love to know one or two more things that I should be looking at in imagery uh, that I haven't been already to help me better understand a reactor's critical status. And this isn't the last slide, but um, this is a very difficult task. However, for the first time ever, this is now possible, right? We not only have the imagery, but we're having an increasing level of fluency or literally literacy in imagery analysis with the student, university, and think tank community. Um, and so this is a study that can be done. But most importantly, like we've tried to display to you today, we have gotten our best results when we leverage conventional optical imagery against other types of sensors, like thermal imagery, and in the case of the Pyongsan uranium mine and the mine exposition, multispectral. So you have spectral signatures, heat signatures, um, with optical signatures, and we finally think that we can start cooking with a true AI model that's on the level of uh, natural language processing. So um, I want to point out, the first question that I'm, I usually always get is, what are the ethics behind this? Um, and and we've, I've done workshops, I've written articles about the ethics associated with satellite imagery analysis. Is it okay for Allison to be looking at the world's nuclear reactors and determining who's got what? Is it okay if North Korea decides to purchase, you know, all these and start looking at American reactors or, or British reactors? Um, so there are a number of factors associated with satellite imagery analysis, especially as it emerges more and more into the open source and journalist community. Um, and things about transparency and literacy. Literacy. I'd like to open the floor to questions, um, but I just want to thank you all so much uh, for your attention. To take questions. Uh, I neglected to note that there's a QR code and we can do that via Slido, but I will give you the microphone in the meantime and uh, we'll still do a quick question this way. Oh, thank you so much for the introduction. I, speaking of the QR, I'm a security conscious person and I don't have a smartphone. And that's my question actually, is the last point, the obfuscation by nation states. Uh, I didn't know what to expect in this talk, but I'm living scared that people in the intelligence, military community are thinking about using the open AI technology for this kind of stuff for several reasons. My first question is, have you confirmed, for example, uh, I forgot the name of the lady, she detected 18 reactors, were they confirmed by human sources that they are real as opposed to an obfuscation attempt by a nation state? I mean, do, do and again, maybe this be a, a, a sensitive question, but unless you have that kind of confirmation, uh, the notion of using open AI type of technology to this could lead us to World War III. That's what I'm trying to say. Mindlessly using, and that's my essentially question, thought, or whatever you want to call it, because it is one thing to hallucinate, so-called to have a false positive, in some, write me some stupid essay about some stupid cat, write down another, tell me where are the nuclear weapons, that given what is going in Russia, that could escalate really quickly to something really, really bad. So, so. I can start by saying, so um, I want to stress that this is not just a, feature but a bug. You're asking me if anything that I'm talking about is sensitive from like a government perspective. No, there's absolutely nothing I'm doing that's restricted by any classification. I actually had a clearance. I make it my business to never work with any classified environment. Um, so it's important to know that none of us have access to classified material by design unless we're working in a cleared facility. Everything we do, you can purchase the same imagery that uh, we used to figure out that there were um, 18 other signatures with a similar chemo, uh, spectral signature, but we don't have any uh, sensitive information to know that. We just found similar signatures on imagery.
Could you repeat that question? There, there weren't sources. We have no. Did you don't have human people? sources on the ground Absolutely in North, North Korea. North Korea so this is just an inference based on some data yes. analysis. Right, right. Okay. And that is the thing that I'm scared about because let's say that you apply this technology to the Ukraine war, and then there is Biden who says, "Hey, there are three nuclear weapons. Whatever. I don't believe you. I trust the AI." Boom. I press the button. We are always screwed. Right. That's the kind of stuff that is scary. Right. Just to, I just want to clarify this: eighteen hotspots were not reactors, but mines. Yeah. Right. And as a matter of fact, we know that they are mines because we confirmed with the electro optical images, but we actually do not know at this point whether or not it is uranium mines. All we know is that the spectral signature was there and it is a mine. But you're talking to something that is incredibly important. Um, you're talking to journalistic integrity. How do we know if what we're publishing is responsible? And we're living in a zero trust world where um, people, and, and frankly, satellite imagery itself, because it comes almost directly from intelligence tradecraft, how do you know that what I'm saying to you is uh, representative of the imagery? So I'm not doing my job if I publish a satellite image with my annotations on it, if you can't sort of intuit for yourself what's in the image, right? So if I'm just saying, hey, look at this, this is Kim Jong-un's grandmother's horse farm. Like you can look at it and couldn't look like anything, but I would have to annotate everything, show you ground images. It's a lot of work to find something in imagery. And then it's another lot, of, another thing entirely over and above the work to convince a journalist, a, a responsible journalist, we try to work with very responsible, why the thing I just told you is, is the thing that's in the image. So um, I, I really could unpack the ethics associated with this. I've been in ethical jams um, there, you know, but the long and short of it is, if we practice open source satellite imagery analysis, to the academic standard, standards of, for instance, the Center for International Security and Cooperation. If we publish to the journalistic standards of the organizations that we've been known to publish with, the, like the visual investigative team at the New York Times, then it's been vetted by a dozen people before it sees the light of day. And finally, we never say, oh, North Korea has 18 mines. We say, we've done a study, we've seen spectral signatures that are similar to this, We've had reportings that this and this and this. There's so much nuance in it um, that we think that by the time it's published, it's a public good. And it's not trying to tell you like, you know, there's a bomb in Burma or something like that. There, you know, we try to use as much standard and qualifiers as possible. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm going to take a question from Slido. And this is uh, plenty of private companies are already using satellite images for various purposes. How can private companies assist in the efforts to use AI to analyze their satellite imagery for the public benefit. So I think, I mean, if I were to read that a little bit better, how can they make their data probably or uh, more effective for this type of AI analysis? The companies do use satellite imagery analysis. Namely, I think the deepest pockets are in the oil and gas industry. There's a lot of people who measure floating lid oil tanks to look for volumes in, for instance, the national U.S. national oil um, storage facility, I think in Cushing, Oklahoma. And so I think the Cushing estimates come out every Wednesday and people try to measure the floating lid oil tanks a few days before to kind of get a jump on the report. So that's kind of an economic reason that they do that. As Sulgi showed you, there's a lot of car counting um, and that a lot of people do stuff like uh, how many cars are in the Walmart parking lot at noon? And then where do those cars go? Do they go to the target? So there's a lot of stuff. So there's a lot of object detection. But to be completely honest with you, like a true AI enabled model, I have not seen that used whether publicly or privately. And even like the most robust uh, AI enabled satellite imagery and analyst organizations, like again, the APL at Johns Hopkins, they're starting, they're still in sort of the infancy stages of trying to figure out like that sort of natural language processing level of AI. Um, in short, object detection has long been used to do things like uh, economics, you know, insurance companies use it, uh, ship detection use it for large scale information, especially if you can leverage that against the stock market. But I don't think, show me, tell me all of the things about this port that's ever happened. That level of AI, I just don't think that's present. Maybe somebody can correct me. I, I just don't think it's quite there yet. I'm also going to make the case again for like student partnerships with these like companies that are publishing this data. So this project wouldn't have been possible without Satellite View offering this very valuable data to a group of five students. And 
if we're talking about literacy, if we're talking about having ethics and standards associated with this kind of work, there's no better time and place than to start this generation, which is so few of people who are actually involved in this than at the university level. So I don't know if there's any private companies listening, but <laughs> I would I would argue for that. Yeah, more collaboration with universities. If I can add quickly to that. So in the 70s, the uh, US and European Space Agency, they launched geospatial environmental satellites, which take super crude, but very consistent images of the Earth's surface. There's an entire uh, scholastic field called GIS, geospatial information systems, that um, exists because of that freely available imagery. What I'd like to see is as high resolution imagery becomes cheaper, I'd like to see the applications come out of the universities um, rather than being driven essentially by the market. So I'm gonna say that someone put this in Slido and it's probably useful is I wanna make sure that everyone knows that Stan the Stanford Geospatial Center maintains subscription access to planets, planet scope, daily and scat sat archival imagery as well as uh, SkySat tasking credits for student research, and that's at gis.stanford.edu. Okay. Oh, are you Stace Maples? Ah. So Stace, do we have access to SkySats? Because I thought we don't. Uh. Oh, nice. We also have about four complete images of the Earth worth of access to planet scope. So that's kind of just all you can eat there. The SkySat stuff, the high resolution stuff, we, we have to sort of meter access to it. And we're primarily aiming that at student research. Awesome. Hey, Stace, I don't think we've ever met each other, but I know you who you are. Your reputation precedes you. Stace Maples, GIS guru extraordinaire, everybody. <laughs> Hello. Uh Fascinating uh, conversation, thank you. I have two questions, but I start with only one. When uh, the invasion of Ukraine began, uh, there was a crowd distribution of studying of uh, imagine of a satellite, uh, um, not only image, also thermal and also the kind of emission, like uh, um, carbon, CO2, or other kind of emissions that can help you to spot uh, um, people moving in buildings that may be inhabitant. So, um, and what happened is that there was a crowd distribution through Telegram channels for people in the West assisting with some kind of intelligence studying the um, satellite. Now, I hear that six days ago, uh, Russia veto on the UN Security Council about the enforcement of the nuclear uh, uh, inspection. Thank you. And so it seems that is the right time for which uh, some kind of uh, crowd distribution of uh, studying of uh, that region uh, can, can happen. But uh, what I saw is that uh, you do not just to let the image available, you need to create a lot of infrastructure, infrastructure that can help a researcher to play with this data, understand what those signals means. And all this infrastructure is the complex part. Uh, what I wonder, and this is a question, is uh, um, do you also plan to provide some infrastructure that can assist st students to do those kind of analysis, or uh, you need to be a PhD student to get this kind of uh, background knowledge? That's a great question. So a uh, curricula for satellite imagery analysis does not exist outside of like for instance, in the US, the intelligence community and the military. There are a couple of little workshops here and there. Um, the Federation of American Scientists is putting on a two week boot camp to do exactly what you're saying. Um, it's a training course in satellite imagery analysis with infrastructure specific to nuclear proliferation. I have actually been working with a number of folks at Stanford to write an actual curricula that involves um, everything. In fact, even like military standard uh, imagery analysis course, that's unclassified using line drawings from a British publication and everything from the tactical identification of a T-72 Russian tank to better understanding which facilities are associated with nuclear proliferation might be on the table. So it's ethically interesting. Do we want 100,000 students to be taking this class? Frankly, I do, right? I think the more people who are knowledgeable and literate, I think the better consumers of satellite imagery there will be. Right now during Ukraine, I've never seen such a um, propagation of satellite imagery 
for the world to understand the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I, it's my hope that, um, that we have more students who are taking these courses or we have more courses available so that students can, can apprise themselves and even being like on the leading edge of this kind of, I think, um, interpretation of an important emerging medium, especially when it comes to um, understanding global security affairs. Okay, um, another one from Slido is, are the research findings uh, shared with uh, policymakers to help them have a better dialogue with, in this case, they say Chinese leaders about their activities, uh, such as the recent check-in call with Biden and Xi, but I think the grander question here is, is, is your research getting into the hands of policymakers and having an impact? I'll start by saying not, not generally directly, right? Student researchers, we aim to publish in a respectable journal. So that might be in itself an ethical question. When um, satellite imagery was the domain of sort of the militaries and governments, satellite imagery analysis would go explicitly to policymakers, uh, diplomats, and military warfighters, right? Now it goes into the media. So the first person to know about a new Indian submarine that's been deployed near the Ch South China Sea it, uh, 30 years ago would have been, for instance, if it was an American who found it, they would go to the U.S. State Department or something and they could make diplomatic decisions. Now it's going into um, um, you know, uh, the Financial Times in the U.K. And so I've seen instances where uh, you're actually coming up with analysis that was formally confined to intelligence channels, and you've seen leaders around the world kind of scurry to make a, um, uh, to kind of, to kind of react to a press statement of intelligence salience. So there's ethical issues that sound it, it to, to reiterate, not generally. People who work at Stanford sometimes can work within folks who also are in the State Department, but we, we aim to publish. You guys have anything on that? And I said it's open source to open access. Everything that we do, we use open source yeah. information and we publish to the open access information. Okay. Uh, another one from Slido. Do we have a question in here before we go to another Slido one? No? Okay. Uh, have you considered using known signs of reactor activity in combination with broader satellite imagery to discover previously unknown indicators of reactor activity? signatures and then work backwards and look in the archives to look for other reactors. I think it's also maybe potentially other lessons learned that you would have gotten from this where it can be repurposed. Yeah. What I'm seeing this. First of all, that is a great idea. Second of all, I can only look at 100 square kilometers of high resolution imagery a day, and that's in an eight to 10 hour shift. So in short, no, there are so many things that are in satellite images from a year ago from some country somewhere. There's probably a transporter erector launcher with a nuclear capable missile somewhere in Mongolia that's been imaged 60 times and I've never seen it. Nobody has. So, uh, so great idea. Personally, absolutely not. This is the same thing we have tried with the uranium mine detection. But with the uranium nuclear facility, the nuclear facilities, I think the signals are pretty clear such that we can, we can detect it if we had the capacity to look at thousands and thousands of images. Yeah. Like we're in the wild west of commercial satellite imagery. A lot of these questions, that's low hanging fruit. Like that's a great idea. You know, the kind of the grant rights itself, there's just not a lot of research done on a wider scale. And it's often actually framing a narrative uh, that's journalistically salient. So right now I could, North Korea is literally building orphanages in every province and nobody cares. Nobody wants to publish that. But I need, if I show them a new missile, that's um, really, really interesting. So it's almost, you're painting an artificial narrative of a country's despoticism and, and drive towards war. Um, so there are ethics associated with who chooses what story to cover. But every, like every question, that question is an excellent idea to kind of go back in time with what we know now and then look for other reactors. That's a fantastic idea. Okay. Other questions in here? I'm go to another, okay. No hang on, hang on. Regarding uh, hacking, um, what can we do to prevent, you know, um, cybersecurity threats to imagery analysis? At the end, sometimes it's very difficult to, you know, on the ground to, to have some intel, real intel that can help you out. And especially if you trust that intel and at the end it was just either, you know, a sabotage 
or there is a deep fake in it, then you're not going to have, you know, real eyes on the ground. So uh, my question to you would be, what, are there any guidelines that we can, you know, follow so far that we can learn from them to prevent this, uh, these threats? And another one probably is part of the literacy. Uh, I don't know if, if, it, if you may. What will be the difference between remote sensing and data imagery? So you ask a question that's asked of me during every presentation, like what, what do we know? Are countries trying to obfuscate the satellite imagery? So I know of one event where I think it was the MH17 where Russia shot down uh, an airline over, I want to say Ukraine. So they, they did not adulterate the imagery. They didn't change the imagery, but they changed the metadata to change the date where it essentially said that there's no way that Russia did that because that was an image. A long time ago, you could have gotten away with that because there are so few images taken. And in fact, when in the first days of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, Russia was saying that a lot of the commercial satellite imagery that was showing uh, Russian attacks against civilian infrastructure were um, erroneous because they were coming from an American company and that was just propaganda. However, in the first days of the Ukraine, this was really when we're starting to see the genius of a multinational constellation because not just American satellite companies were imaging the Ukraine, but the same city like Mariupol was being imaged by an American satellite company on the very same day, a Chinese satellite company, a Korean satellite company, a French satellite country. So you're getting like the United Colors of Benetton level of many different countries operated by companies. It's really hard to adulterate the data when there's so much diversity in who's collecting the data. It's a little harder to fool somebody. I think somebody said it better. You can fool some people sometime, but you can't fool all the people all the time when you have five different countries imaging the same site on the same day. You can't fake all of them. You would have to hack every single country. And over and above that, it's kind of hard to, you can, A, I have not seen AI fake satellite imagery yet, but there's a big conference in Berlin this year where they're going to try to fake it and how they can figure it out. The data set in short is a little bit too new for us to really see faked satellite data so widespread, but it's certainly a concern. And I think people are behind the curve and trying to figure it out. Can I, can I just... I think what you're asking is also speaking to the limit of the remote sensing analysis work. I don't think it can completely replace the on-site inspections. And I think international treaties and on-site inspection is still a really valuable way to verify what's going on. Remote sensing is just complementary analysis that we can do to monitor the activities on a daily basis. Access areas, um, for instance, Syria during the war is fully denied. You could get a journalist in there, but the, it was so dangerous that often satellite imagery was helpful in understanding the scale and the scope of, of the battle damage, but it's not telling you the human story, right? In the case of North Korea, which is almost totally denied access, except for literally like a couple of members from CSAC in the 2010s, satellite imagery is our lifeline to help figure it out. We aren't trying to say that this is exactly what's happening, but we are trying to responsibly report on the data that's available available to us on one of the most unknowable countries on earth. You need. Yeah. Um, I served in the directorate as in the nuclear energy resources for Mexico. And we had a meeting, probably it's classified, but I've already said you know, that was eight years ago. Um, that we had uh, some Russians coming in to Mexico to offer us this intel, this imagery analysis on many on the grounds. And to be honest, we couldn't afford it, you know, because the, 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 the Secretary of Energy for him, the United States, when at the, you know, the, the minute the, the Russians came to us, they were there, the, you know, the, ne the next day. I mean, I don't know how they knew, but they knew that the Russians came to Mexico. So at the end, we didn't know what to do. And to be honest, we couldn't afford whatever they asked for. But, you know, it, it was a big concern to protect, you know, the data imagery on hacking. So that's why most of the budget went to, hack, you know, to prevent uh, hacking on our satellites. You're bringing up something really interesting. A lot of countries now, um, it's it costs a trillion dollars to indigenously produce, like, and design an imaging satellite and launch it. A lot of companies are just buying 
satellites and they're really inexpensive, but what they're also doing is trying to get training on how to do imagery analysis. Um, I know the US, Russia, Japan, a number of countries have a really robust uh, imagery intelligence capability, but almost all the rest of them, they just don't have like an imagery shop where people are really good at looking at imagery analysis. It may be the case that when Russia was trying to offer you, it sounds like a private company was trying to charge you. Um, you may not have had a robust imagery intelligence capability to evaluate whether that was a product that you wanted or not. The fact that it's a Russian company might have raised a couple of flags. I, I don't know. Um, but I think it comes down to literacy. Like the more literacy that you have, the more you can evaluate whether a product is um, real or there's an ulterior motive, I guess. Okay, well, that was, uh, we're at time, but thank you everyone. And let's give a round of applause for our panel.